Go ahead. Oh. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Good evening. Good morning. Uh, it depends, of course, wherever you are joining us from in the world today. I am Sandy Eno, and I'm the host of Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. You're joining us for our live poetry open mic during our 37th week of continuous Sunday poetry readings. I'm joining you today from the Eastern time zone in Old Sabre, Connecticut, which is my hometown um, where I grew up. I'm originally from Olympia, Washington, which is where you're usually seeing me record from or, or joining you from, but uh, I'm just three hours now in a different time zone and always happy to have a different perspective on things. Well, Cultivating Voices Live Poetry, just for everyone's information who may be watching live in Facebook, we are a weekly reading series that started in response to the pandemic. And we keep persisting in our responses week after week. And we are planning to ring out the year 2020 with some exceptional poetry in this month of December, as we've been having ever since we began in March. Well, so how about a little bit of our hour one poets? with a reminder to please check out their bios, which I'll be putting um, in the chat here in Zoom. And also you can check out their bios on our event page where there are links to purchase books, chat books and other swag. It's so important to support the poets and their presses. And so I hope you certainly will do that today if you have the resources. I just wanna remind those of you joining us in Zoom and on Facebook Live, because we have two audiences. Please use the chat, give your love and support to our writers today. And I'll come back uh, near, the, near the end of the hour to introduce our hour two poets. Well, first up in our uh, first hour today is Medha Bhattacharya, who is an assistant professor at the Department of Basic Studies and Humanities, in, in the, which is their English department, in Bengal Institute of Technology, joining us from Kolkata, India, where it is, I like to remind folks, it's quite early in the morning. And we're very grateful to have um, Medhav joining us today. Her book published this year by Routledge is Ramadranath Tagore's Santiketan Essays, Religion, Spirituality, and Philosophy. Again, that's from Routledge. Her poetry has been featured in international anthologies and journals. She's received awards for her outstanding contributions to teaching, learning, and research from Maulana Abul Kalam Azad University of Technology in West Bengal, India, and has been invited to deliver talks across India and abroad including at Harvard University, Princeton University, and the University of Pennsylvania. It was so interesting. We got to hear um, her talk a little bit about that work that she's been doing and, and lecturing on. After Meta will be Greg Buck, who, uh, G. Buck, who is a maker living in Olympia, Washington. This year, they are completing their MFA thesis in interdisciplinary poetics at the University of Washington Bothell, while also working as an editorial assistant with the Essay Press. When not tinkering with words or arranging scraps of color, G can be found wondering what is for dinner and how to best prepare it. I like that. <laughs> After G will be Marianne Lovett, who is an arts writer based in Sligo in the Northwest of Ireland. From 2016 to 2018, she was co-editor of the relaunched 
Circa Art Magazine. While her area of expertise is in the visual arts, she has steadily developed her poetry practice in the last four years. And she is currently working on completing her first collection. Her catalog essay, 100 Flowers on the work of Anne Labowitz was recently published by Burnett Art, Fine Art and Advisory, Minnesota. Her newest essay will be published, Four Windows into the Book of Ballet Mot, will be published by Stony Road Press Dublin in January. And to, find, to round out our first hour will be Angela Dribben. When scoliosis pushed her to retire from her career as a massage therapist, Angela Driven still wanted to be of service. So she began doing legacy work through her local hospice. As she did that work, she felt she needed some skills if she was going to honor others. And she then started an MFA program. From there, her work made it its way into journals such as Crab Creek Review, Cider Press Review, San Pedro River Review, and Crack the Spine. Her first mixed media piece is coming out in Patchwork. And her first collection, Every Girl, is now out in advanced sales with Main Street Rag. And we will definitely put the link in the chat for you all. She'll be joining us um, in the new year for a new book showcase reading. So there you have it, our first four poets. And I will turn the stage over to our dear friend in Kolkata very early in the morning. Thank you so much, Meta, for being with us so early this morning. Thank you, Sandy. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, there is something romantic about reading poems and listening to them in the middle of the night. <laughs> and it's really the middle of the night in Kolkata. So it's very uh, romantic. I mean, this is the first time I'm doing it. Um, the first poem that I would like to read is Abode of Peace Within and Without. And this was published in Gitanjali and Beyond. And this, was, this is a publication from Scottish Center of Tagore Studies. And the poem goes like this. Abode of peace within and without. My home is everywhere under the sun, moon, and stars. Under the breezy shades of enormous trees at Shantiniketan, on the carpet of dewy green grass, the crimson hue of the sun playing hide and seek with the branches of trees, swaying in the breeze. I arise, I awaken. I do not feel the lack of that omniscient being present in nature. Looking up the sky at Shantiniketan, I wonder, is this the same sky Rabindranath Tagore gazed at? On seeing the pa river Padma, I wonder, what must Tagore have thought? Those amazing translations he inscribed just as a mere exercise of relaxation lazing amidst the greens and waters of Shilai Daho. Yet, it was the leisurely activity that bore the fruits of his lifelong labor. Listen to that unspoken word. Listen to the deep rumble of clouds. Listen to the songs of Rabindranath celebrating six seasons of Bengal. Listen, see, smell, taste, and touch. Feel nature all around. Realize the abode of peace within and without. I wrote the, thank you. I wrote the second poem a couple of days ago and it is titled, Alone Up Here in the Pandemic. It can get really lonely up here. Looking at oneself in the mirror and seeing only one reflection of yourself. Is that bad, you ask? Didn't you sign up for it years ago 
when you started to climb the stairs, burnt the candle at both ends to be at the top of your game, but on this mensiversary, your reflection is yet alone, celebrating alone, waiting, continuously waiting, with hopeful anticipation, with love and tears in your eyes, just waiting, patiently waiting, hoping the wait would soon be over, just as the pandemic should be over, a thing of the past. But eight months now, and more to go. Does it ever get better from here? Counting and just counting, being alone, independent, being yourself, no anxiety, no waiting, entirely a different kind of love, being mindful of your own life, being together with the emotions of the entire world, counting and still waiting just then comes the much awaited call. Thank you. Uh, the next poem I'm going to read is uh, a transcreation of Rabindranath Tagore's Tota Kahini, which when translated is the parrot's tale. And Tagore um, mentioned this uh, story as a critique of the education system it was relevant at his time and it is still relevant now. So I tried to weave the features of a tale into verse. So he, Tagore's story was a story, a tale. Mine is a verse. So this was published in Inspired by Tagore, which was um, the publisher is British Council and Sampath South Asian Arts, B Birmingham. And uh, the title of my poem is Tale of a Parrot. Once upon a time, there was a parrot. It ate fruit from trees and voiced utterly radical thoughts. Perched on treetops, did no work and hindered profits. His majesty ordered the parrot to be taught and be well behaved. Visitors enviously remarked, ah, the parrot so lucky. It lives in such a magnificent golden cage. But do you know what the ungrateful glum bird did your majesty? Fumed its keeper. It hankered for sunlight and flapped its wings furiously. It wanted to be free. Luckily, we thwarted its escape and had its wings clipped. We have fenced its golden cage with iron rails. Such an ungrateful bird. Time went by, the king summoned for the bird. The parrot was brought before him. His majesty pressed the parrot with his fingers. The creature voiced no cry. All that was heard from within was a hustling, bustling, crispy noise of all the scriptures consumed by it. Alas, silenced by its education, the parrot was dead. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to read a couple of more poems. <laughs> Thank you. Um, this poem is titled Madeline's Doll. Madeline built her doll a little house. Could it fall? She never asked. In it, sunshine never basked. All Madeline knew was that the doll should not stray. The doll wept and wept, but that did not soften Madeline. One day, the doll crept out of her little house shrine, tiptoed out, walking like a scout, free to dance about with tin soldier rout. Madeline came to feed the doll breakfast. Oh, greed, she exclaimed, has made her go. She cries, what will Johnny say? Oh dear, I'm done for. Since Madeline could not keep the little hostage, she must weep. But look at the doll, dancing with grace, fear not, fears not Johnny's wrath, knows her real worth. I shall follow her footstep. Dare anyone stop me at the doorstep? 
And then finally, um, this is another, thank you so much. Uh, this is another poem um, which I'm going to uh, read. It was published by Get Bengal in an online uh, competition. And since we are approaching a new year, that is 2021, we tend to make new year resolutions. So my next poem is about that and it's titled Unkept Resolutions. Resolutions, what are they? Well, decisions that are meant to be made or not and deeds that are meant to be or not. Who says so? Well, everyone. And I, what do I want? Why bother with them resolutions? We make them on every New Year's Eve, but do not keep them up. Either they're too tough to keep or too mundane to be maintained. Live like there is no tomorrow. It is here and now or never. Broken pieces of glass never get mended. Apply your brakes if you have to. Press the accelerator with your foot if you have to. Discard the garb of guilt. Don't make resolutions because you have to. Live and let live. Thank you so much. Thank you for the patient hearing. Thank you uh, so much. Um, I guess I'll just go ahead and get started. <laughs> uh, my name is uh, G Buck and I'm gonna screen share um, so that you can uh, see what I'm reading. Uh, I think it should be here, where is it? Mm. Cool. Let me let's take a moment to see why it's not. Nope, that's not it. Ah. I had it set up and suddenly now it's not wanting to work the way I want it to. So we're gonna just make this easy and do it the old fashioned way. I'll just read. <laughs> um, to begin with, uh, thank you, Sandy, and uh, the organizers of this event. Um, it's my second chance to read and I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, as was mentioned in my bio, I'm working on a thesis, um, which is to, has become a collection of poems um, and fairly sprawling. Um, and as much as uh, I want to get to all, there's 480 entries that I'm looking to make, um, and I'll probably only be submitting uh, maybe 100 of them. Um, and yet I seem to be caught up in the very early parts of the work, uh, revising and revising. Um, and so there's a visual component that if I had been able to pull up the computer, you'd see it, but here we are. <laughs> Um, so this first one um, is called Relationship to Brother. Um, July 14th, 1974, Monday. During the WXLT TV broadcast of Suncoast Digest to Sarasota, Florida, newswoman Christine Chubuck fatally shoots herself in the head. Relationship to Brother. Mother, story, tells me others, another, me, actually not me, but oh, Brother, gifts, excitement, wrapped up, his toys, he hand me down in the crib, he climbs infant at four years, invites in a new stranger in to his house, like petting a cat or getting a dog. He's nice, you know that, mother wants to say. She tells this a lot. No, 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 that is right, she said. He said that, no, was his first word. She said, he said, but in this instance, in the crib, no, it was not negative, he was nice, know it. No, that is not what I remember. Remember that he loves, loved you once, she says. This once or twice, often enough, I recall, but he had a way of showing brotherly love. We visit Philly, Oh, years later, 
not always kind, kindle memory, kinder little bother, brother. Oh, boys, be at up each other, bear it, but it's just that way, sways. Boys will be at each other's throats. Oh, dears to being a buck. Thank you. Um, September 8th, 1974, Sunday. Aging daredevil, Evil Knievel, fails to cross the thousand foot Snake River Canyon in his Sky Cycle X2 rocket, which fails mid flight and falls, leaving Knievel with a broken nose. Impression four. Impression four. A sheet, not this sheet, laid out blue. Turquoise white, sheet pattern cut in geometric squares, triangles, a graphic designer curves abstraction of Hawaii ocean and baby sleeps on TV background, plays, breathes through open window from through the screen, base planes fly over, land below, deplaning families bring friends, everyone comes for gifts of pineapple, hospitality for visitors, everyone is a friend when you move into paradise and gifts are given for new baby sheets, tucked into pull out sofa beds, though not comfortable. Bars cannot stop digging in the back. Still, more people come. Hawaii, once in a lifetime. More sheets, the flowered ones with the wash of 70s yellow, avocado, cream, and blue sky ice cut into petals, cool on the other side of the pillow. Uncle Ray and Aunt Zella, as feared, camp out for a month or perhaps more. Right. Thank you. Um, November 22nd, 1974, Friday. The United Nations grants observer status to the Palestine Liberation Organization, PLO. Tissue, flesh, sweat, tongue, sweet, nose, flowers, six. Seasons in paradise don't change. Balmy, effortless, nice. Held in arms, at times held at arm's length, little baby sweats like her husband's genetics, drippy fluid drenched. Sweet baby greets, sweet maybe. Her mother sweats in paradise. Maybe visiting with her a purse full of pink, sweet and low. Maybe here to see twin Ray, kindly Lady May's brother. Maybe somewhat fretful, says she's unsure to be underfoot. Maybe speaks of, maybe has concerns, maybe leaks, anxiety drips. Maybe every fiber of her being is forever extended out about to pour, to help, a dote, assisting, baby, baby, baby. Maybe carefully buzz, buzzes carefully all about. Maybe grows doe-eyed and gooey, sees little baby coo, loves gagging, willing to stoop, St stopping strangers baby prams, held up snooping carriages jam a park, or block up freezers in green grocer aisles, sweet old little maybe, lady fond of smooth baby bottom, skin perfection, twinkle eyes held against loose arm folds, perspiring like a little baby, just like the little baby, her twin daughter's little child. In arms enmeshed in paradise, pleasures pressed pleasant, Maybe's temperature is too hot for baby and grandma both. Entwined into each other, maybe enfold baby in arms wet waiting on cool breeze blowing fair trade winds scheduled at noon until further notice with seasonal changes at the corner of youth and not yet an old lady, not yet retired, not yet retreated south to abandon Jersey, go near Orlando. Maybe she's certainly old enough to disapprove of that goddamn rock and roll Burt derides jungle music, while here in paradise, she only holds hula hopes to Tico Tico on steel drums. Nothing harder. She's a softie, wants to jelly roll babies up, take them away in suitcases, fly little ones home with strollers, rolling along an infantile fantasy. From another wasp's seals and croft, a nearby room, a radio, must be jasmine. A corner garden in the first Hawaiian house near a baby's little mind's puddles coalesce and muddle, not clammy nor cold, 
not floppy, hot, messy, drenched. Sweet rain comes quickly at noon when sun shines, shining through. Maybe sets baby on rubber blue sheet padded bumper near open windows casement cranked open. Invitation, she says. Don't hide your light under a bushel basket and maybe on a summer breeze makes me a fine feel how she shows off baby and Jasmine and Jasmine. Thank you. Um, aside, regarding ghosts and the remorseless, Haunted by ghosts, though they don't know I don't believe, so they continue haunting all the same memories. Less a fright, more a shiver, where ghosts come upon me, take over history as stirred up hostile bees nests where empathy stings. In absence, they are close to the same. Either way, you are left holding the sensation with no body to send the feeling off to or out upon. You get to hold it, hospitable to regret, yet you never put out a vacancy sign. Such lodgers, knowing their haunts, need no neon buzz. Ghosts see space in your eyes to enter and, well, stay. Thank you. Okay, it's over to me. So um, it's 8.30 p.m. here in Sligo in the northwest of Ireland. It's actually really, really cold and there was snow on Ben Bulban today. That's the very large mountain that kind of looms over the city of Sligo. Um, but the snow poem which I'm gonna start with is, it's more snow in the context of an urban setting in the context of a very small back garden um, in, in Dublin. And so this poem is called The Silence of Snow. It's not yet daylight, a new snow falls and sits, flat caking the circle of the picnic table that centers the small backyard, an urban garden, its tiny kerchief size and almost square, suddenly surprised and beautified. Flakes fall fast fast and thick onto the fronds of the giant fern, giving grace to a constrained space. Its branches droop, unused to the weight of fresh snowfall. Pure whites this virgin spread dropped overnight, and the light, the light is a pale gold as the sky throws down and the snow shines up an altered yellow from a distant sodium street light. It spreads its glow across the blanket of pure and bright, unsullied early morning snow. A muffled dawn comes with it, an audible quiet. This whiteness, tiptoeing, transfiguring a small gray city backyard. Briefly, it becomes a frosted slice of heaven. Okay, so that's all right. Um, just progressing. This is a poem, I, I just wrote it about a month ago, but it's actually set back in the mid 80s when I was a student in University College Dublin, studying art history. And every Thursday we would head over to this beautiful little classical building. Um, but in the context of the campus in UCD, it, it, was, it was an unusual place in that UCD is a very, very, very modern campus and a bit ugly in, in, in places. So the poem is called Silver Point and it goes as follows. Art conservation classes took place in the Tempietto, a pillared ancient gym hidden behind the modernist brute of the arts block. Every Thursday, a dedicated few of us headed over there to learn the methods of the great masters, great mistresses did not figure yet in the grand canon. We learned 
how Giotto's frescoes were made one square at a time, reassuring to hear how a masterpiece can be broken down into so many days hard work, each one a giornato. We made tempera from brilliant yellow egg yolk, saw how it produced the most luminous of colors for the Arnolfini brothers. We came to recognize the beauty of a bird line, how it fades as the print plate ages. We learned the meaning of exotic terms like sentimento and palimpsest, but it was silver point that took my breath. The softness of the line I drew across the treated plate, silver mixed with zinc, transforming student scrawls into fine lines. I looked to Leonardo to be my guide, sensing his understanding of the feminine. My attempts to copy Head of the Virgin looked clumsy to my eyes, though my classmates gathered round and said, I really got it. At the end of the second semester, we each took one piece home. It was 1984, the year when a girl whose name echoed mine died petrified with her newborn child in a field at the feet of a plaster Virgin Mary. When we left the flat for summer, I binned my precious silver point in an ochre yellow skip. All faith had fled. There was no such thing as a virgin birth. History, society had me convinced. I could never measure up. Okay, so. I guess I'm also very conscious of the fact that, you know, this is a hard time of the year if you have suffered a bereavement. Um, I think it's a very raw time coming up to Christmas when we inevitably we miss the ones we love. So this poem called Winter Blue was written um, just, I had, just after I had gone through the, um, the bereavement of my own mother. So it's written for her, it's for Johanna, and it's called Winter Blue. In the weeks and months after they have left and coming up to Christmas more over, as she always used to say, take time, take it and listen to your loss. Take time to let your heart heal, to think and dwell on the lives of loved ones whose loss has left you raw. Especially think of those not too long gone whose absence looms vivid, vol voluminous, filling every room. Think of them and the great love they gave. Laugh and cry and smile as memories floodgates open. Pull out the photo albums, recall the conversations, write down their words of wisdom and hang those spools of memories on the wishing tree beside the holy well. Hear back their voices, feel again their touch, their smell. Remember how they'd say, I love you to you, and you'd say it back, always as you said goodbye. Give grief its place. How you feel is how you feel. Let none downgrade it. Feel it deeply, keenly, without apology. Mourn, weep, howl. Sit by their headstones in forlorn graveyards in November, if needs be. And having done all that, put pain away temporarily until it asks to be released, held, embraced again until deep tremors ease. Do all this until the burden thins and spreads like seeds, for these in spring will send out shoots of hope. Respect the agony, the ache, pay grief its dues. And then when jagged edges soften, you'll see its gray one shape recede, its specter fade. And when all that's left is longing, dreams and shadows, consider this memory, grief's great gift, a truth, a brief reprieve. So yeah, that's for my mommy. 
I think all of us have loved ones, you know, that have gone and who we will miss. So, um, my fourth poem, I actually just did this very quickly at a workshop um, very recently. It's called The Woman and the Snake. And the curious thing is that um, I'm sharing a, a study space with a snake right now, actually. He's over there in the background, you can't see him. But um, my son, my eldest son left it behind when he headed back to Wales to go to college. Um, it's called The Woman and the Snake. The python and I, we share a modest working space, a cabin in the cold Northwest. He's in his glassy lair and I sit at my desk. A rhythmical trickle of water gurgles in the room. This meditative backdrop restrains our rage and fury, keeps us quiet, calm. But elsewhere there are jungles with lush grasses, the whir of crickets and hot, humid air. Me, I long for Kerry and the thundering cascades of Torque Waterfall. So, um, okay, this I think is my last poem and it's just, it, it's like a five liner. Um, it's simply called Orb. So I think it's a nice one to end on Orb. Full moon, crescents of eyelids, half smile of sleep, my beloved. Okay, that's me done guys. Uh, a pleasure as always. Um, looking forward to hearing the rest of you guys. Okay, so Sandy, thank you again. <laughs> Such a privilege to be here. Good night. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. Um. Still work? Okay. Oh, can you all hear me all right? Okay. Um, I uh, did hospice massage before I did legacy work, and now I uh, validate medic Medicare plan things and the way um, passing is handled between the two is very, very different. And so uh, this is about that. Cease to breathe. This is all I'm required to see to validate a Medicare disenrollment. We need more than this to substantiate an address change to declare someone dead, gone, no longer in need of service, just a worksheet explanation, ceased to breathe. Even CTB will suffice. The unsacredness of it makes me queasy. Not at all how we greeted death when I worked in hospice, when I prayed before entering, when I invited the cord of God to bleed into my crown before entering the home where scarcity of time is known with certainty. As I cupped cracked heels and my palms called on light larger than my own, as I gently feathered thinning skin, coercing capillaries to move palliative medicines through withdrawing bodies, the dying told me all they wished they'd done for those they loved, always for those they loved. Dig my love a swimming pool, one said. I wish I'd just done it. The loved one inevitably calls soon after the body goes to shell, before the funeral even, and again after and again, knowing I carry a piece of their beloved, knowing when a light passes through us, it leaves a shimmer of itself behind, knowing energy is intimacy, they beg me to come back, to cradle their heels in my hands and let them be close to their beloved once more. Um, I, uh, I went to a military school and um, it was for high school as a family tradition. And there are about 30 girls and about 300 males and is you can imagine um, it, it's, it was a setup for, 
for unusual uh, experiences. So you might hear a little bit of cadence calling in this one. Jello butt. I am jello butt when Sergeant Tennyson calls cadence. Left, right, left, jello butt, left flank, march. Eyes forward, locked, no falling out of formation today. Ignoring his jabs fails to deter him. It is the private's job to obey. If he looked into me, he'd see I'm smaller than the rifle I carry. See my mood as quartermaster gray, shouldering more than unadorned epaulets can handle. See me in a family tradition, a girl failing to be man enough to fill out a boy's uniform. Before I get to school each morning, I've already imploded a daughter floundering to float, a mother, a daughter unfit to mend a family, a truant father. I am willing to settle for home, reprieve anywhere it is offered. Saturday night, I ride with Sergeant Tennyson down to Bannister Bend, drink a few beers by water's light. A 15 year old's imagination dreams it's simple to find a new home. Just draw smiles on a man's face with my lips half open. Show him secrets I slice like Morse code along my forearms. He will take me home, be my roots, my spine. Instead, he pulls my head into his lap, sticks himself inside my speak when spoken to mouth, obligatory Bob until he is pleased salty. It changes nothing. Drill on Monday. Play if. Right, left, butt. This one is for my sister. My sister. Freckles I inventoried, hair so thick and fine, it refuses to hold a braid, does nothing but grow. Mama only came at her once that I know of. I sent my sister out to sit beneath the dogwood. Told our mother, if you ever touch her, I will kill you. Valiant sounds. I really meant I want a better reason to kill you than for myself. If only instead of reaching for revenge, I had cradled my sister, pulled her into my rounded rib cage, held her there as though my lung was womb, coffer, strong box, breathed her immune, intact. If I had taken her with me, not left a month later, left her behind. Thank you. And um, this one is also about things we leave behind. Um, anyone who has ended a relationship where you were cohabitating, you, you, you know how complicated that becomes. Things I left behind, the ignorance that I could make right, the dream my parents broke, my weeping willow, one of a pair planted side by side at Pond's Edge where we beached the canoe, left her to wither at the root and tump into the water. Bedroom painted in yellow skies and blue sun, twin bed frames spiraled with wrought iron tulips, a refrigerator magnet from Maggie Valley, sloughed skin cells intertwined in dust along baseboards behind the lawyer's bookcase, its glass etched with 12 point bucks. My social security number on a debt, name on a mortgage, a deed, Radio flyer sled my daddy pulled me down the driveway on. The wood stove from my grandfather's general store, too heavy to lift alone. A garish attempt at Southwest design, cactuses and shades of Sedona painted around the fireplace. Two golden mop cypress, six holly bushes. There's always the dogs you leave behind. Some buried beneath locusts, others alive. An eight-year-old stepchild, mouth full of teeth, $2,000 be better off than when I found her. Things I took, grandmama's cameo, you know, the one Pop Pop brought her back from his time serving under Patton, and a 17-year-old stepson who reminded me on my way out the door, 
that I said no one should have to live this way. Um, and uh, I'll leave on one full of hope. <laughs> There is all, there will be music despite everything. Thank you, Jack Gilbert. <laughs> um, forgive those as we forgive. A military prep school, two battalion commanders, three defensive backs, a postgraduate point guard, a goalie, not the band, one of the Highlanders complete with kilt and bagpipes all before I was 15. By 24, there was a man who said his wife didn't understand them, another with a six inch lift on his pickup to make him look taller, two heavy drinkers, two heavy handed, one who was both a pilot, a ninja, a live mannequin and a water slide tester. Therapists and biologists say every man who comes inside a woman leaves his mark, whether she chose him or not. I was a scarred young woman mistook love and safety as something that came in the shape of another's satisfaction. Some science says sperm may divide and survive in a woman's brain, possibly her nasal passages. Regardless, sex left its smallpox behind in some organ not yet named by Western medicine, sitting beneath my heart, percussing with it, my acupuncturist says it is the most vital organ, says mine is deflated or mutated or contaminated, its pulse wiry and fast. She prescribes granules of sour jujube fruit to sip in tepid tea three times a day. And I begin to forgive myself. Thank you, it's a pleasure to read here with all of you, thank you. Thank you. Well, you see all the clapping in the, you could see it in Zoom. We still can see the clapping. And uh, for our hour one poets, let's unmute ourselves and let's hear, hear our gratitude for our, four readers in our first hour. Thank you. <laughs> I recognize that kitchen. Yay. I recognize that kitchen. Hi. Okay. Hi. <laughs> well, friends, what I really, really appreciate every single week when I come to these screens for Cultivating Voices is how distinctive each voice truly is. Mm -hmm. And poetry magnifies that for, 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 for us. And uh, you know, what, a, what a display of that in the first hour. We heard from four poets from all over consciousness and humanity. Medha, Bahatacharya, Jeebuk, Marion Lovett, and we closed our first hour with Angela Driven. Again, such amazing voices. Thank you all. We head to our second hour. I know these voices also. I'm familiar with their voices. And we are also in for the continuation of that distinctiveness that is this art and practice that we call poetry. It's much more than that. And we all can attest to many of the things that it is. But we will hear from the following three poets whom I'm so grateful to have joining us on this Sunday. Well, first, joining from Waterford, 
Ireland, a place I have had the pleasure to visit, but I have not had the pleasant pleasure yet to go to Anna Jordan's American Bar yet in Waterford. <laughs> That's my next trip. Yeah, you really yes, right? we have to open yeah. first, you know. <laughs> oh, oh, well, okay. we, have, we will have to open our doors first. <laughs> If folks, if you want to, this is me all going off the cuff a little bit, but I've had, Anna is singing covers and some of your own original work on YouTube at times. And if you can catch her playing the piano or the guitar and singing, you will enjoy that as much as hearing her poetry. So let me share with you a little bit more about Anna and uh, encourage you to look for her on those videos that pop up from time to time. Anna Jordan is a writer and arts event planner extraordinaire, I'm going to add in. You're very, Stop. very <laughs> I'm Irish, I can't cope with this. <laughs> arts planner. I love the events you put on. Based in, as I mentioned, Waterford City home to all that crystal. I've seen that large crystal in Waterford at the museum there. She is a founding member of the spoken word movement, Mod Words, and its annual grassroots art festival, Mod Words Fest, which was virtual this year. Uh, I hope it'll be in person next year, but maybe a hybrid so everybody can partake. It was amazing to attend She's a pa she is passionate about community, which is really evident if you attend any of the festivals that she um, creates and generates. Passionate about community development, community and old buildings. Anna also works freelance in creative writing and is the co-founder of the annual charity event, Busk Aid, and is a publican by trade. I love that. Our following Anna will be David Bridges, David C. Bridges, joining us uh, from Northern Ontario, Canada. David is a cultural historian and community legacy builder. He is the artistic director of the Spring Pulse Poetry Festival in Northern Ontario, Canada. I look forward to attending that in the spring and has memberships include the Parkland Poets, another great reading series if you are interested in an open mic environment in Canada, and Stroll of Poets in Alberta, the Ontario Poetry Society, Haiku Canada, Academy of American Poets, and the League of Canadian Poets. David has four chapbooks published and one full length collection Listen to the, Angela, listen to this title. I love this title so much. Vagabond Post Office. What a great title, right? And finally, our, to round out our readers for today, after Anna and David will be Joanne James. Joanne James is a dreamer and yogi. She lives in Eugene, Oregon with many people who do not have homes. She is singing in the tunnels where the ghosts of the apocalypse go. I look forward to our trio of poets and Anna, take it away after that beverage. Yay, can you hear me? Thank you very much for the really, really lovely introduction. Um, that was very, very nice of you. I really enjoyed listening to it. <laughs> and thank you for having me on again. This is my third visit here from Waterford in Ireland. So I'm really actually happy for Cultivating Voices because I probably wouldn't participate in anything if it wasn't for Cultivating Voices. I feel very comfortable and safe here. Well done to everybody else's poetry. It's really it's really, really outstanding tonight. I don't know, there's, some, there's a different heartbeat tonight. It's wonderful. 
Um, I'm going to open up with a piece called Kitchen Table. Yeah, heartbeats. <laughs> um, it's called Kitchen Table and it's a short piece. Kitchen Table. Underneath the oiled cloth is wood that had been earthed with the bones of my ancestors. Leaves that were twigged from the marrow, breathing them back into the air on the world inhales. We eat as a family upon it, drink tea and lemon cordial. I breastfed my firstborn at its hoof. He is now a man. Someday we will be rooted in soil, climbing into the rings of time, breathing out new breath into a world, reaching for a sky that we will call heaven. That's number one. So the second piece is called, what are we doing in time? Okay, full stops. Sometimes I leave out full stops when I message you, as I don't feel you deserve them. Leave sparse messages unfinished, like my lack of heart will teach you a lesson. Leave inboxes unopened and messages seen and unreplied to, as though they are small battles achieved before the ultimate war. The small spits of spite that put some quiet on the bombs in my mind, as you don't message that often or leave messages open for reply. And you'll never know more than my only hate for you is to leave sentences unfinished, like a heart standing on a bridge pulsing a silent cry for help. Missing apostrophes, unstopped full stops. Thank you. Now, this is a recent one of something that I am trying. <laughs> so this one's called Sober, which is like something all of us Irish people have to come across because we drink so casually. <laughs> so we have to start weaning this into our lives in around our 30s or 40s <laughs> in order to survive. Okay, well, this one's called Sober. I don't miss staring into a Saturday night until I lose vision or unscrewing the second bottle of wine at my lonely kitchen table or the bits of my life that I missed to the hiss of an opening can. I miss the first glass of wine rushing to my cheeks, warming the blood that pumps to my heart, pushing words to my lips that have me speak poetry to paper and love to the world. This is the finest part, the start, not the end, where I lose days in a haze of fear, top up to steer smiles, war paints to hide the wounds from battles of the night before, bottles at the bottom of bins, sins on your skin, lies on your lids, walking fast, can't stop, going nowhere. Red wine replaces blood in a broken heart, filling cracks, stalling the attacks grabbing a grip of something that's lost and stealing it, having new thoughts beat to the brain, new breaths breathe from the lips, new rhythm, new pace, new speed. It will push up the laughter from your gut you forgot to laugh and set you free. Spin the fun from your spirit you forgot was there, making the world aware of how wonder, how much wonder you really have to share. And while the clock stops for you, it speeds up for everybody else. And the song follows you about like a broken record, skipping you out of people's lives. Saturday night's loss of vision, lonely kitchen table bottles of wine. Sobriety is like finding your soulmate. The greatest love story ever told, the one where you lie hand in hand with your heart, respecting all of your tomorrows, in love with your future that you get to remember. So <clears throat> that's my, my new, I'm going to give that a lash for a while anyway, <laughs> so going on the lash. Um, <clears throat> there is one I wrote around, I'm sure you all remember, the George Floyd incident at the start of the well in around the first quarter of the year it really had an impact on the whole world it's a it's a, a, a very old story it's almost like that one phrase that he well it's his tag mark is just gone down through history so this was my take on it I live in a kind of a neutral country where we're at the start of seeing mixed race we're only watching it in its first and second generation start to go into our society and in my world, the world I live in, it's quite embracing. 
but I do understand having spent time, spent a lot of time in New Jersey and New York when I was younger, I understand, I understand there's a divide there that we hopefully will never see. So this one's called George Floyd. Um, I have skin all over my body, it is an organ. It sheds on my sheets and passes to people's clothes when I hug them. It traces me back through history. It marks the fingerprint on the glass I put to my mouth. The sun makes it darker. I was in the heritage of man. We were all kissed by the sun first and put our feet into lighter pores, whoring our origins to the pimp they call the dollar bill. My skin stretches to the dark man of every shade, the Normans, the land down under, the street corner, to Europe, to the bare-butted tribes and Neanderthal, to the first skin, to hunt, to a monkey, to the fish that came from the ocean. And each bead of sweat that the sun extracts, I know that we all share the same history. I am white, milk bottle, fake tan and lashes, buying a musical personality that traces back to the first human to hit a rock the first rhythm that matched a heartbeat, that evolved into every record that hit revolution, untelevised, unrecognised, unneutralised, unnationalised. I bruise easily, as my skin is now soft, lightened down but dark, that I can feel my heart, the same part of me, that has been regenerated since evolution became a forgotten history, and yet he can't breathe. Thank you so much again for having me. Thank you very, very much. And best luck to everybody else and well done to everybody. Thank you. Joining us, there he is. I, you got me. Yeah, Joanne. I think David is I'm up next. next. No, David's up next. Yeah. Is that all right? Oh no, I just said host. Ash. No worries. It's all good. Oh, thanks, uh, Sandra, for um, um, introducing me to your um, your fantastic uh, uh, series and all the new poets too that I've come to uh, meet today and uh, heard their fantastic uh, uh, poetry too. It's really been great. Um, um, I've been writing this poem for the last four years, and I have not officially been able to um, to read it until recently. Um, it's called uh, Post Trump. And I was kind of curious why, uh, um, um, you know, all the um, those on high, um, what they do after, you know, um, when Biden's team comes in in January, um, where are Trump's characters going to be going? So it's a little uh, uh, sketch about that. We must especially beware of that small group of selfish men who would clip the wings of the American eagle in order to feather their own nests. Franklin D. Roosevelt. Better white-winged angels of sanity after a four-year absence return on decayed wings to a divided America. They notice the smell of mental sewage around the White House is gone. That swamp that was supposed to be drained actually got enlarged. Soulless Republicans, tongues savagely silent, wander in political purgatory, watching their moral compasses melt from the heat of hypocrisy. Trump's frivolous mission impossible legal team used the courts as a theater of the absurd delay tactic, then attends a funeral of credibility as deadbeat lawsuits are thrown out, dismissed by the facts matter side of democracy. It was all a media circus led by 
Giuliani, the clown, as a fundraising ploy. But when you read the fine print, it's a slush fund for his reelection campaign. After making America a quasi banana republic, El Presidente moves to one. He's welcomed as a hero. Baron, his son, begins Spanish lessons. Trump starts a new reality TV show called The World's Biggest Political Loser. Melanie feels her wedding ring getting itchier and itchier as she searches the yellow pages for divorce lawyers. Ivanka and Jared Kushner move to Israel and buy a McDonald's restaurant franchise. Trump Tower in New York is sold to a Chinese billionaire and he relocates his offices to a two-story building in the Bronx. Hope Hicks, personal assistant to the president, retires to North Dakota and marries a cowboy. Stephen Miller, Trump's senior aide, becomes president of the right-wing group Proud Boys. A mob of Guatemalan immigrants chase him, still looking for their separated children. Attorney General William Barr is surrounded by a peaceful group of Black Lives Matters protesters. He screams, I can't breathe. Vice President Pence takes over as pastor in a small Indiana congregation since the former died of the coronavirus, proclaiming God will keep us safe. Black limousines, the perks of power will be gone. Instead of hail to the denier in chief, it will be hail a yellow cab for his enablers. All of Trump's propaganda puppets lose their master as the stage is set for the truth tellers to triumph with no strings attached. Thousands of fact checkers in news media around the world are laid off as straight shooter Joe Biden saddles up. Putin approves Trump Tower Moscow and is given a $50 million penthouse suite as payback. Trump's brotherly love dictator, Buddy Kim, invites him to live in North Korea. The only condition is he must bring his own food. Trump is a no-show for Biden's inauguration. He goes golfing instead. But 300,000 show up wearing white masks with the names of Americans killed by this virus. The demagogue's dynasty is dead too. Americans dance in the streets. Democracy's roots are young, but its spirit tree is ageless. Imperfect, but more perfect than a perfect delusional dictator, the American eagle rebuilds its nest again on the highest branch of optimism. Thank you. I'm, I'm really glad. Uh, I, I've read that in several Zoom events in Canada, but it was really nice to read it to American folks and people around the world, too. So, um, um, any Thomas Burton fans out there? Uh, yeah, good, good. Um, Thomas Merton was a, a, a monk and a mystic and a, and a poet and a, a prophet also and a, and a social activist. And even in the 60s, he foresaw uh, through his poetry and writings, the uh, overwired nightmare the internet has uh, bred. Um, so I'm reading this poem from the, um, it was published in the, uh, the Merton Seasonal, uh, a quarterly review. Um, and it's called Madness of a Dying Age. There is a voice that doesn't use words. Listen, Rumi. The singular solitary voice streaked with anger echoes through the vanishing point where sanity once stood alone. Sincere words spoken in the wilderness from someone who is wilderness. Food for the gods delayed in transit by angels whose rusted wings were broken from inaction. Once, golden age, heaven and earth had a highway of transcendental traffic. 
raids on the unteachable, holy perfume bottles leaking madly in modern minds, unable to erase the scent of secular sewage. The solitude of ironic intimacy knows more about the world by not being in the world. Your books, latent lightning rests in dark corners of impotent libraries, burning with irrelevance. Someone, oh, there's a little more, <laughs> second page. <laughs> um, someone invents a new app to design a soul, a correctly computed algorithm developed by Google engineers in a secret Silicon Valley laboratory. Robotics, virtual reality, and artificial intelligence, techno Frankensteins unleashed into the human zoo. Merton screams, where is real intelligence? The world is one big megaphone of inhumanities, rioting, protests, ills of injustice, police brutality, bleeding black communities to death. Another deceased father never to take his daughter to the swimming pool. Merton weeps for the fallen innocent. He raises his blazing words in social solidarity. While nature vacations from capitalism's noisy business, it emerges post-pandemic looking for silence. Merton's ears know white whispering winds blowing through the cells of someone in a cell. Hiding deep in rare white pine old growth forests, waiting for the teeth of chainsaws to teach submission. Trees once towering in magnificence have only stumps to mark their graveyard and grace. While mercy never left, the earth counts its death casualties. Thank you. Thank you for keeping um, I was scrolling through the internet um, one, one night and I came across an article about um, the oldest trees in the world. Does anyone know um, uh, what the oldest tree? Yeah, um, good. Um, uh, the bristle, bristlecone pines actually, and they're in California. Great, yeah. Um, and it got, to, it got me thinking about our climate dilemma right now. Um, bristlecone pines. Trees are poems that the earth writes upon the sky. Cahill Gibran. A benevolent living symbol of survival. Humanity needs this ancient spirit. Loomed gnarly magnificence from the twisted restless wind. I hear wood song in the cathedral. Soil and air write your supreme history without a natural ending. Planetary co-partnerships thrives. Basic blue sky intimately honors heavenward flight trajectory. Asleep while the apocalypse nears, wise teachings of a noble earth tree help us awaken the need for unity. Sanctify our challenge with fresh seeing as the biosphere burns itself into oblivion. Hmm. And um, this is for all the cat lovers out there. I noticed that Ryan had a cat. Uh, does Sandra, do you have a cat too? Yeah, anyone else have a cat? <laughs> okay. Uh, so, um, and I, 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 the Zoom events I've been on, there's always kind of cats roaming around here and there. And uh, anyway, so um, some days I wish I was a cat. I have lived with several Zen masters, all of them cats, Eckhart Tolle. <laughs> I've overslept. My ankle is painfully swollen. I limp from bed, a creaky old man needing maintenance. Raven, the feral cat, is at the door and wants breakfast. Cats are communication minimalists, precisely embody what they want to say. I, serial verbalizer, Mimic meows. She gives me a blank face as if I've just stepped off a Martian spacecraft. Her language, primal, simple, as she meows once, cocks her head at the door. I let her in. She smells like laundry on the clothesline. Our pickup ritual is to scratch the head and ears. After her back, 
stretches like a yoga master doing a backward downward dog pose, she lands down beside her bowl of tuna, eats as if nothing else matters. I have the TV on blaring tragic news and the latest scandals. In the living room, I'm doing my yoga stretches, joints tight with adult tension. Like a stealth jet, she sleekly crawls between my legs, announcing she's in a playful, feisty mood. She scratches and kicks at my hand, sometimes drawing some blood. Um, then it's time for another nap, and the cycle begins anew. Eat, sleep, play, eat, sleep, play, all day. I've got two out of three, but the play part does not come naturally. So I wish I was a cat someday. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and my final poem is from Vagabond Post Office. <laughs> and um, um, it's a, um, something that happened a few years ago before Christmas. And um, uh, th this poem is dedicated to um, my mother and, and all mothers um, for their absolute underrated presence on this planet. The vintage cookie can. After grandma's passing, her daughter on the next street inherited her traditional cookie can. Since mom's death, the red lidded round can with oriental font orange letters spelling cookies rest empty atop our pine kitchen cupboards. Masterful hands once crafted dozens of peanut butter, gingerbread, chocolate chip in a venerated kitchen of spicy delights. Coming home hungry after school, if time right, we'd be granted one soft treat from her baking sheet. Letting goody gifts harden, a layer of wax paper covered its bottom before they're safely stashed away. Christmas is near but no turquoise sprinkle shortbreads warm the old cookie can, dearly missing its matriarch. Grateful family ghosts inhabit this museum of sweet crumbs, exhibiting a household treasure. A canister of love from a heart whose oven was always on. Thank you. I think I might have too much light. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I agree, Sandy. Everybody's work is so different on a whole different. Uh, that's what happens when you find, follow your own voice. I was going to read first um, a quote by Ellis Notley. It makes people furious when you speak your own language. <laughs> so that's where I am. The first line of this is from my introduction that Sandy read find out where to write it. Are you using in the tunnels where rather the oceans, can you hear the oceans? I left a, a case of chocolates and cheese doodles near the entrance. Are you seeing a light at the end of the tunnel or is that a train coming towards you? Are you feverish with excitement? Write me a letter, here's spray paint so you can become a graffiti artist. Do you know Morse code? Remember what Central Park looks like. Recharge your batteries, button your sweater. I've been launching ships, eating chips, smashing champagne bottles on the stern, sending you a message in a bottle, glow worms, a flaming torch. Does anything make sense anymore? Why has laughter lost all meaning? 
I'm a serious girl in a broken world. There's no safety net. There's only the tumble and fumble of love. Magic charms have lost their magic. I've drawn the five of swords. Do you feel my discontent? Is it the tunnel of disguise? You've drawn the tower and the cataclysm thrown to the ground head first. Then you land in the tunnels of worries and mercies. I cough up a stone, a blue agate in my hand when earth was near and dense when earth was giving and tunnels ran to the heart of it. The days are senseless. If I tell you any more, I'll give it away. Listen to the rats singing. The rats singing take that leap of faith and leaps of plague in secondhand thrift stores. Are you lost? Are you waiting for angels finding you in darkness like glowworms and deep sea creatures, angels like moon jellies without fur? Maybe a crevice. Will you sing there shaking off blaze, doling out wisdom? Will you sing there even when your heart is broken? That's the first one. <laughs> Our world is a match flare in an immense dark night. Oh, blood on the ancient water rising, pulse on the immaculate light. We exist. We suffer tsunami. We suffer earthquake and tornado. We suffer attacks of killer bees. We suffer drought, flood, starvation. We wage war and kill one another. We suffer illness, old age. We grieve darkness falling on the world. Will we remember it's time, in time, the ancient world, the place where poppies filled the fields and the air smelled like opium? We, fe we feasted on nut meats and pomegranates. The trees were there, were prehistoric horses lived there, the Chivalskis. We could see their breath on chill mornings, ghostly like hoarfrost. Horse tail, dragonfly, cockroach endured, held revenge and ignorance. It would trip us up, spill into the ancient waters. Now we are blindfolded, swinging at pinatas filled with anguish. We must do the high dive, seek out caves, stand unclothed in moonlight. We will still suffer. We will learn fearlessness as our vulnerability pulls us back to the shadows, rhyming our breath, darkness falling on the world. Need water. <laughs> Probably everyone feels this way. I feel like this time with the quarantine is changing my voice. In this high noon called midnight, the cough of sleep, the sleeve of doubt. My mind is midnight, crackling flames, everything exposed, poetry tattooed on my heart and no one there to read them. High noon, thunder, everything blinded. Who can't find solace? Who can't slip under the covers and melt? Sticky sap, I chew my nails, a bite to the core of the sun when moon was a blessing and we knew better. When we both went mad with jealousy, we never slept together in a forest. Oh. Can you hear me? I had a note that I froze. Did I? <laughs> okay. A bite to the core of the sun when moon was a blessing and we knew better when we both went mad with jealousy. We never slept together in a forest. We were waiting for a run runaway train. You are floating in a deprivation tank at midnight, hoping for a revolution. Black licorice 
insomnia, the black ice on the sidewalk in front of the mosque. There are things I never told you in whisper, high noon, cusp, silver shiver, moon on the indecent lawn. I brought uh, just two, <laughs> thank, thank you. I brought two fragments. Um, this is my own quarantine. One year I had, um, well, I had walking pneumonia. And then when I found out I had pneumonia, I had to stay home another month. So I was like six weeks at home. And what came out of it is I wrote a page every day. I have 40 pages of single spaced <laughs> writing. And I found this when I, I found this that I wrote about it. Uh, this is about the rough basement. That's the title, the rough basement. The rough basement of mind flow, where it all begins, the foundation, what is stored there. I have a whole thing with basement from where I grew up. <laughs> so, we run around the track. I run without my glasses on. She worries about me running blind. I remember there was a light rain, no one else on the streets, maybe early Sunday morning. It was a time I wanted the world to be blurred. I wanted to remain indistinct. I have my convictions and she was one of them. How things were different because we kissed. Another little piece is what I was in love with changed with seasons. Pure gasp. It carried 1,000 lights in it and countless anemones, tidal multitude, the practice of meaninglessness. When the storm broke, I drove towards home, little bells in the night, the sound of digeridu, a vibration of healing. At last, driven towards expression like any other, turquoise landing in the bed of moss to feel helpless is perhaps the greatest wisdom. <laughs> you, have to, you have to feel like that in my life. Uh, lots of quarantines that I didn't expect. <laughs> Those two, those two were written just, that was a, you know, I just wrote them, the whole thing stream of consciousness. I never read it anywhere before. <laughs> this is um, a preface this with a quote by um, a poem, Ada Limon, Limon. I am soundless amid the constant sounds of war. Luna, silver rockets thrum in the sockets. I enter such broad whispers. I want declarations beyond war tones of light capsized. And who was waiting at the crossroads when my name was Warabic, before she was Max, when I climbed onto trains? There was no scenery, granite walls held together by wild cards. And that dark graffiti, internal combustion when we met, pelicans diving into the splunk of sea, always pelicans on our horizon when Seabright Beach was home. Times a sweet apple bruised at the core, a parakeet I named Miracle. Dense ship of fog from the west when fortunate moon slips of light found their way like mystery. We slept under the stars, but never saw them. Time blankets that beach town now. Time's an imposter, a white cat leaping into my arms from tall grasses. Time's camping in the fields near the ashram. Learning Sanskrit in the afternoon. What if you wrote like you were running from a train coming behind you? Those knives and spoons, those things we have had a long time, we have had each other a very long time. Surprise, 
like a chunk of red jasper in the war of time. We've held eyes that have tripped us up learning foreign languages, eating cabbage salad. Time's a puzzle. Do we really want to remember the last crows in flight? Now the trees are declarations of every close blossom. Oh, I go. The last poem was a little, oh, it was amazing. And at the it end of it, it cut out a little yeah. bit. All it right. said, it said this. You're unstable. Stable, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you, yeah, it's, it's, it's cutting out for some reason. Joanne, may, maybe um, you'd be turn willing off, to turn off your video and maybe we could hear your last poem again. Yeah, thank you, Don. Yeah, that's what I, I've tried, tried that before. Yeah, I was loving it. I don't want to not hear the whole thing. I'm, I'm, Cut off. I'm selfish that way. <laughs> Hmm. I was thinking where I might have started. Want me to read the whole thing? How about I start at um, the parakeet named Miracle? Did you hear that? Mm -hmm. A dense ship of fog from the west, when fortunate moon slips of light found their way like mystery. We slept under the stars, but never saw them. Time blankets that beach town now times an imposter, a white cat leaping into my arms from tall grasses in the fields near the ashram, learning Sanskrit in the summers when I was 17. What if you wrote like you were running from a train coming behind you? Those knives and spoons, those things we have had a long time. We have had each other a very long time surprise like a chunk of red jasper in the war of time. We've held eyes that have tripped us up learning foreign languages, eating cabbage salads. Time's a puzzle, a declaration of fizz. When was the first time? Do we really want to remember the last? Crows in flight, now the trees are declarations of evergreen, pillows blossoming, time. Thank, thank you. You heard that better. Joanne, I can't imagine not having heard, you know, uh, that, that the, the line about time and then a declaration of fizz. We didn't hear that. And if I... I like I was like oh my gosh in this you know the first time so oh I, I I'm so glad we got to hear the whole poem because the the surprises that we that we missed I couldn't even I I'm not you right so I can't create I can't create those visions brilliant I love oh thank you fabulous everybody you have been here watching Cultivating Voices on this first Sunday of December 2020. And you in the second hour tonight or today, depending on where you're joining us from, heard from Anna Jordan, not at her kitchen table, but evoking the kitchen table. We went from Anna's kitchen table to David Bridges' kitchen table, grandmother's kitchen table, and I can taste those cookies. And we ended our reading today with Joanne James. 
fantasma of images. I loved how things moved throughout those poems from one moment to the next. Uh, I really, really loved the, 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 the movement and some kisses. I liked that there were some kisses. Folks, I can't thank you all enough for being with us today. A reminder to join us next Sunday for our new books showcase with three poets here from the United States, Dana Kid Patterson, Jamie McCarty, and Paige Starzinger. For fun, they're actually friends and we don't usually have friends who are reading together. It doesn't always happen that way. Um, but this particular alchemy will have the alchemy of friendship involved in the reading. I hope you will join us next Sunday. And in two weeks, we're going to have a live holiday poetry open mic. So I hope you'll join us on December 22nd. Well, it is always Sundays that we're together. It's always 12 Pacific, one mountain, two central, three Eastern, eight o'clock over in Ireland, in the UK. And I'm most of the time, Sandy, you know, and your host of Cultivating Voices, live poetry. I wanna encourage everyone this week to be very well. I'm very happy to have heard from Marion that the lockdown has, um, that folks are out of lockdown, at least in her part of the country. And uh, I wish I could say that the same was true here in the States. Um, but I encourage you all to be very well, take exceptional care of your beloveds, which of course means wearing your masks. And my friends, what range of things, what possibilities, what imaginations have we, had, have we yet to have imagined or shared? That's what happens when we keep writing. So keep doing what you do. We'll see you all next time. Have a very good week, everyone. Peace out. Thank you.